It's great to be with you this uh, third Sunday of the Eastertide season. Uh, It is a season, it's not just a day on our calendar, and so we get to look at a number of resurrection passages together. Um, If you would, just hold your place uh, in John 21. If you do have a Bible, we'll we'll be looking at that. Let me pray. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be pleasing to you. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would speak through your word to us, that you'd be present to us, that you would bring the healing, redemptive, continual call to us that you brought to Peter that day on the shore. We ask this for your name and for your glory. Amen. So I'll never forget uh, the breakfast uh, that I had with a friend a few years ago here in North Texas. We were at one of those restaurants. They've actually since closed down, I guess because of COVID, but they had funny names for all their breakfast entrees. And uh, I ordered the white lightning. Um, it was an omelet. And my friend said, well, that was my nickname in high school. That's what they used to call me, the white lightning. Uh, it wasn't the omelet. It wasn't the meal. It, it wasn't the coffee. It was the conversation and the sadness of my friend that I'll never forget. He had been a Christian for quite some time, but um, eventually he had made some mistakes in his marriage and the marriage fell apart. And he ended up losing his wife and eventually his job. He had blown it, and he was sharing this with me in a way that he hadn't shared with anyone else. It's one of the vocational um, things that happen when you're a pastor, is that sometimes the silence is broken for the first time, and he was sharing this with me for the first time. A follower of Christ, he had wanted to serve Christ, and he had, but things had gotten really complicated, and he had made some mistakes. And in that meal, he ended up saying, look, I still believe in God, but I just don't feel like he really wants me back fully. Whatever I've experienced up to this point in my life, it just seems like whatever that call was, it's now over. That call is over. He had this sense. I was thinking this week about my own call, my own journey in Christ. I've been a follower of Christ for almost 30 years, and what I've come to find out is that even if it's not as dramatic as his, this story is not uncommon, where we arrive at a place where either we have done something or maybe something's been done to us, and we conclude, whatever that was, it's over. Whatever that was, it's over. Sometimes it's big, dramatic mistakes like the ones he made. But it can also be a daily thing. It can be a reality just in our daily sort of grind that we get to the place where we have this deep inner feeling that I just don't see how God can use me anymore. I don't have a sense of this purpose anymore. And um, if that's you, this, this this is a really great day. If you can relate to the feeling like, man, I just feel done then today's for you. But if you can't, I want you to know you need to file this away because you'll eventually eventually get there. You'll eventually be at the place where you'll think, man, I'm too broken, I'm I'm too messy. I want to share three scenes. I know we've read some great passages, but I want to share three scenes that are scenes that are um, encounters between the apostle Peter and Jesus. And I believe they walk us through this pattern that I want you to not only observe, but I want you to apply it to your own life. So here's scene one. Scene one. This is the initial call of Peter. And it's given by Jesus in a chapter, Luke chapter five. Now, a few months ago, we looked at this passage in detail. But I want to say a few things about the initial call of Peter. Now, it's going to sound really similar if I were to read it because there's so many similarities between Luke 5 and John 21, which you just heard read. In Luke 5, Peter's a professional fisherman. He's been around and heard of Jesus, but he's out fishing. They fish all night. They catch nothing. And the next day, Jesus walks on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he says to the men, have you caught anything? No, we haven't caught anything. Well, hey, put out into the deep are the instructions. They do so. They take in a miraculous haul of fish. Again, this is Luke 5, totally different scene than what we've just heard in John 21. 
And Peter, at this point, responds to this miraculous catch by recognizing that the man in front of him is not just any man. This is the Messiah. This is divinity. And he ends up proclaiming. He, he, he sort of falls down on his knees in the boat. You sort of see fish flopping everywhere. He falls down and he says, Jesus, I'm a sinful man. Look at this response. He fell at the knees and he said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Luke chapter 5, verse 8. I'm too broken. I'm too much of a mess. And we know that Jesus responds in this moment to Peter's confession. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. And I want you to notice that Jesus in this moment doesn't say, as I said a few months ago, well, Peter, you've tried your best. You know, you're fine. You're, you're real, actually, you're awesome, Peter. You're awesome. Don't say that about yourself. He doesn't do anything that our modern-day culture does to try to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. He says something really profound that's worth close observation. Jesus says, there is nothing to fear, Peter. He doesn't say you're amazing or you tried your best. He said there's nothing to fear. Peter, in this moment, in Luke 5, is saying, Jesus, I'm so broken and sinful, you need to get away from me. And Jesus, in this moment, is saying, Peter, because I'm holy and you're not, you need to get close to me. And if you've journeyed with Jesus very long, now here's, here's where I get to the main point I want to make in this initial call. If you've journeyed with Jesus very long, you will eventually come to the place where you will realize that the curvatas, the bent in on yourself, the selfishness, the self-focus, the sin in your own life is deeper than you thought. You'll look in the mirror and you'll go, man, 30 years and I'm, I'm still this messy? Jesus says to Peter at this initial call, don't be afraid. In verse 10 of that chapter, from now on, Peter, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up to the shore. They left everything, key word, and they began to follow him. Now, Peter, Peter has been called by Christ. This is the initial call. He's been said that everything that, that, that God had, God was going to use everything, even his, his skill as a fisherman, to now be used for a purpose. He has this sense of call, and Peter quickly moves to the front of the class. If you've ever studied this story, you know Peter's one of those students that he sort of rises to the top, and very quickly in multiple settings as they're following Jesus together, Peter sort of advances to the front of the line. And there's one particular moment, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds to Jesus, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And Right there, there's this an, another just affirmation of this call on Peter's life. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Peter. A flesh and bone hasn't, blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, and you are Peter. And he names him. He gives him a specific purpose in this life. And it was personal right there from Jesus in this initial call. Let me just ask you the question, what is your call from Jesus? What's your purpose? Did you know that every single one of us has a call to live on purpose for the kingdom? Some get this really early. Check this photo out. This morning, my bride of 20 years is fulfilling her vocation to bring healing to people through medicine. She was really little in these photos. Uh, the dog was the first one to have to receive medicine and and, and I'm sure you can look back in your own story. Some get this call, this sense of purpose, really, really young. She had it really young that, like, I think I'm supposed to help people with, with, with medicine. I think I want to be that and do that. Um, I promise I made the best attempt to find a photo of me at 17 years of age standing in a white Miami Vice suit preaching in front of my church in West Texas. Uh, I was 17, really young, when I had this deep sense that God had called me for a purpose. But I want to tell you something, that Jen and I have talked about this, and I have permission to say this not only about myself, but about her. We were a lot like Peter in this initial call because we thought it was up to us. We thought it was all about our performance. We thought it, it was a, a purpose that had been given that was to be pursued in our own strength. You know, being called to a purpose is really different than receiving and being given an identity, and you've got to know who you are first. 
as a child of God. It wasn't until later that Peter and Jen and myself began to realize that this call cannot be pursued in our own strength. What's your call? What's your call? What's your purpose? You have a God-given purpose. When we look throughout Scripture, sometimes this is big, audacious leadership roles like Moses and Joshua. Sometimes this is hospitality like the prostitute Rahab. What we know is that every person is called by God to a purpose. What's your purpose? What has he given? What has he called you to do in this life? Some are called by God in very specific ways, and they realize this early on. Sometimes it's something as simple as hospitality. Sometimes it's being a foster home for children in Denton County. We have a friend this week that I've just been blown away by his family's commitment to that. Um, no job is too big or too small in the kingdom. What's your purpose? It'd be so awesome if you and I could know our purpose. I know there's lots of ministries and sermon series and studies out there that would help you to discover your life's purpose. Wouldn't it be great if you lived on purpose every day, like to the fullest? Like you saw Jesus so clearly and you understood your purpose so deeply that you were just sort of on the mountaintop on a regular basis. Well, it doesn't always go that way. So there is this initial call that begins in Luke 5, but then here's scene two. You ready? It's the fall. Luke 22, scene two, is found in Luke 22. And while there's an initial call, there is also followed by that a fall. And in Luke 22, we find Jesus sharing a meal with the disciples just prior to his death and resurrection. And he tells them all something that they're totally shocked by. He says, every one of you is going to bail. Specifically, he looks at Simon uh, this particular passage has just been, I've been uh, mesmerized, almost haunted by this. Simon, Satan has asked, has demanded, has requested to sift you, to separate you, to break you down like wheat. But Simon, I've prayed for you. Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, that you would strengthen your brothers. But he replied, look at Peter's reply, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. In John 13, the parallel passage, he actually says, even if all these losers fall away, I won't. Is that, does that sound just a little bit prideful? And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times that you know me. You will deny three times that you know me. And he ends up in the next 12 or so hours being asked three different times if he even knows the man Jesus. Are you connected to him? We think you're one of his followers. You know the story. Three times he says, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Here's the third one. Same passage, Luke 22, verse 60. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know who you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and he looked straight at Peter and Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And Peter went outside and began to weep bitterly. As the tears are falling down this strong man's face, he realizes, man, I, I had it right all along. I told him at the beginning, back when we were on the shore, that I was a mess. And I, I'm, here it is, I'm, I'm proving it. I blew it. I blew it as a parent. I blew it as a friend. I blew it as a pastor. I blew, I, I've fallen flat on my face. Has that ever happened to any of you? You know, sometimes kids make mistakes that seem irreversible, don't they? I, I remember when Tucker was a little toddler. He knows I'm going to talk about him on this one just for a moment. He couldn't, he didn't, we let him, we spoke for him. Did any, any other first-time parents do that? We did all the speaking for him. And so right, right there, it was like he, his words weren't, weren't really with him yet. And he comes out of my, the master bedroom into the kitchen, and he says something like, I thought, fa. What? What was that? I said, Tucker, Tucker, what did you say? I thought, fa. Um... I said, you need to pronounce your consonants, young man. No, I said, Tucker, come, come show me, come show me. So he takes me into the bathroom and he shows me a location where he had started a fire 
at two years of age. Somehow he had managed to flick a match right onto the magazine holder, and there was a flame roaring up the bathroom wall. And he's two. I start fire. There's other times you as parents, you have stories like this where a permanent marker became a friend of a wall or scissors to somebody's hair. Um, Sometimes there's these mistakes that seem irreversible. There was another kid a few years ago who found a little envelope and really just wanted to do what he saw his mommy doing in her office. And so he found an envelope and she had been shredding papers and having little Leo help shred papers. And so he shredded some papers and mom and dad began looking for that envelope that had 1,000 600 US dollars in it, and they couldn't find it. And mom thought, oh, let me go look, let me go look. Sure enough, in the bottom of the shredder bin are shreds of 1,600 US dollars. There's a little photo of it. They took a photo. I forgot to take a photo. I should have taken a photo and video of my fire in my bathroom. Look at this photo. There's little Leo. He's so proud of himself. And uh, 1,600, I, mean, I don't know if that's all of it, but this is some of it. Sometimes our children make mistakes when they're young or when they're old that seem irreversible. Well, let me tell you, at this moment, Peter's looking at the bottom of the bin, and he's shredded, he's spent, he's done. He thinks this is it. He thinks the curtain are, is closed. This is the final word on who he is and on his call. But the good news for Peter and for us is that this isn't the end. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is not something that just applies to Jesus Christ, but to the whole universe. And so he's going to call Peter back to life. Scene three. So there's this initial call, then there's the fall, and then I I, I don't know what else to call it, but the continual call of the risen Lord. Some of you have heard an initial call way back in the day. And it feels like a faint voice. You need to hear the roaring lamb proclaim his call on your life today. Several important resurrection scenes, but this one in John 21, Peter at this point, I wanted to show the initial call in the fall so that you could understand the power of what's happening here in John 21. He thinks he's done. In fact, there's only, out of all the resurrection scenes in the gospel story, there's only two people that get a private appearance with Jesus, and it's Mary Magdalene and it's Peter. And the angels actually tell the women, go and tell the disciples that he's risen, including Peter. Peter thinks he's done. Seven demons, three denials, they get a private audience. Now here he comes, walking on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, in John 21. Okay, same shore, same sea, and actually the same activity. They're fishing. Peter is fishing. Now, um, this coming fall, November 9th through the 18th, we're going. You got to see the Sea of Galilee. They're, they're there. They're, they're on the, he's, on, he's walking on the beach, Jesus is. And they've not caught anything. Sounds really similar to the, this initial call scene, doesn't it? I mean, God is so good and gracious to reverberate his call in our life. Here we are in the same sea, same activity, same shoreline. They've not caught any fish. And Jesus calls from the shore. They don't quite know who it is, as you heard read. And he ends up performing another miracle. Hey, throw your nets to the other side. They catch this huge catch of fish. You see, all these same parallels are here, except there's one thing that's totally different here, like completely different, and that's Peter's response. In Luke 5 to this miracle, Peter says, depart from me, I'm a sinful person. I'm such a mess, you've got to get away from me. But in this story, did you hear what he did? When Father David read it, Peter awkwardly puts his outer cloak on, and he jumps into the sea, and he swims to the shore to get close to Jesus. What in the world? What a distinct difference between what he does in Luke 5. They realize it's the Lord. Peter doesn't say, depart from me. Peter jumps in the water, and he swims up, and he gets really, really close. Why is this response so different? Let me just say, it's different because Peter's performance is so much better now. No, it's worse. 
It's not any better. It's different because Peter has realized that his strength is not found in performing, but in receiving from the Lord. At the center of Peter's story in Luke 5, when he's starting out at the center of his story, it's Peter and his own effort and his own energy and his own strength. And in John 21, he's got nothing left. He knows he's coming to the Lord empty-handed. North Texans, North Texas Christians are prone to listen to this initial call and to think they can do it, that we can do it in our own strength. If we just muscle up, if we just grit our teeth, Peter's realized through his fall that there's no hope in that. There's no future in that. And in John 21, I don't know how else to say it other than he's finally gotten over himself because he's just undignified. He just jumps in the water and swims to Jesus. The mess that he is, not only dripping wet, but on the heels of his denial and rejection. What does Jesus say he's going to do for Peter, even though he knows Peter is going to deny him? I don't know if you caught this in Luke 22. He says, Peter, but I'm praying for you that your faith wouldn't fail. I know what's coming, but I'm interceding for you. And, and, that, and that once you've turned back, like Jesus already knows what's going to happen. And he's on his knees longing and seeking after an outcome where Peter would actually turn. And look, he says that you would turn back to me. And what will you do when you turn back to me? That you would strengthen, strengthen your brothers. What a beautiful phrase. Peter gets the initial call, he falls, he gets this continual call from the risen Lord. And notice it is not about being restored to some uh, pecking order in the kingdom, some position. What does he, he do when he's restored? He's to strengthen his brothers. What a beautiful vision of communal, collegial, mutual life together. He's to, he's to love those who are right alongside them, to strengthen their faith He's recommissioned not just so that he can have Jesus back to himself, but so that, so that he could serve and love others. Now, let me tell you, all four gospel writers tell about the fall. Why is that? Why do all four gospel writers tell you that the leader of the Christian movement in the first century not only had an initial call, but that he fell flat on his face and Jesus restores him? They're telling us something about how this works. Closing illustration. You remember the $1,600 or so, somewhere around there, that was shredded. Well, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, you know about this division of the U.S. Treasury? I didn't know this until I heard the story of the shredded money. Uh, look at what they say about mutilated currency. Mutilated currency is that which has been damaged to the extent that one half or less of the original note remains, or its condition is such that its value is questionable. Now, when I read that this last week, I thought, hmm, I can relate to that. I can relate to getting to a point in my life where I go, I'm like 50%, 20%, questionable at best. Well, I don't want to like, we're not going to overwhelm them the size of church we are, but they get 25,000 requests a year to redeem currency that's been damaged values in something around 30 million dollars, 35 million US dollars every year. Um, Jesus Christ in his resurrection makes such a difference that you and I, when we think that we're done, when we think that we're spent, when we think that we're shredded, he restores us, he puts us back together, he redeems. He redeems everything the enemy has stolen and shredded in our lives. What a savior we have. What a friend we have in Jesus. Um, this morning, we, uh, sort of the climax of the service is we get to come to this meal. Father David and I were talking about this before this, this, this service started, that isn't it so beautiful that Jesus being such a perfect creator and parent and father is able to say, come and have breakfast. We know about the Last Supper and what he, the command he gave in John 13 and Luke 22, but here he, he sets the table for Peter when he's broken it. Would you see the grace of our Lord inviting you this morning to the table to come and have breakfast with him on this Easter morning?
Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you not only call us, but even when we fall flat on our face, you continually seek us out to redeem, to restore, to heal that which is broken. Father, we need to hear your voice speaking and calling to us again. And so would you, Holy Spirit, speak to us as we come to your table. For those who have never heard your initial call, young and old, would you speak to them and call them to yourself? For those of us that have struggled to see our value, our purpose, would you continually, risen Lord, call us? We ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.